Hey, if everyone can take a seat. We are gonna get started here. I'm so grateful that everyone's here. We have a special treat, and that Steve Hilchy is our, uh, going to read from the book, the entire book of Philemon. So get excited for this moment. Steve Hilchy, take it away. The book of Philemon. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Apphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier in the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because of the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he was indeed useful to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I prefer to do nothing without your consent in that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this is perhaps why he was parted for you in, for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. All right. All right, thank you so much, Steve. Really appreciate that. Well, welcome to February, where we're talking about love, and not just because Walmart and all your social media ads are about love, uh, but we figured, like, the reality is, if the whole world is talking about love, we might as well be, too, because it's free advertising. It's kind of like in December, how the whole world talks about Jesus and Christmas, and so we do Advent. So it kind of works out that way. We can capitalize on what the culture is talking about, but the culture sort of gets it not exactly right. Am I right? Uh, and here, if you're a single person, where are my single people at? Yeah, all right. So here's what you're being told and the message that you're bombarded with. It's this, ready? If you look hard enough and if you work hard enough, you can find the one. It's like at the end of this rainbow, you'll find this pot of gold and there the one will be and all your dreams will come true and you'll live a Hallmark movie. That's sort of what everyone is sort of taught as like single people and every sort of media that you consume sort of compounds that message that something is missing and wrong with you because you're single. And so therefore, you better get married soon or you're gonna be alone forever, ever, ever, ever. <laughs> okay, and then, and then, there, the, the message to married people is, is your marriage not as happy as it should be? you're probably with the wrong one. And then it's like, you know, you need to find the best love and there, you married the wrong one, no problem. In America, there's redos and you can start all over, start fresh. Don't you deserve to be happy? 
And that's the message that is compounded over and over again. Uh, and so what happened, I think what, what, probably the problem with all this is that we think that once we find the right one, we'll be fine. And the reality is you're the wrong one. And here's what I mean by that. I think we've been sort of raised and trained, sort of like, or rather, we've never been trained how to properly love one another as single people, and so we're terrible as married people. And so what I wanted to do is kind of take us to a place that's actually not a romantic relationship, oddly, which is the book of Philemon, uh, to talk about how to have hard conversations, okay? Because in the New Testament, there's like 100 love one another's, all right? And so when you... You, when you say that, does that mean like that those love one another's, is that like take somebody on a date? Well, obviously it can't mean that because it's not all about eros love or romantic love. It's all about this thing of loving one another as a brother and so, uh, or a sister in Christ. And so this February, as the whole world talks about love, we're gonna, say, we're gonna talk about loving one another. And this week, we're gonna talk about honoring one another. Uh, next week, we're gonna talk about uh, blessing one another. The following week, comfort one another and showing hospitality to one another. Now, here's, this, is, this is important. If we're commanded to do it, there's a reason for that. It's one, we need to do it because it's good for us to love one another, but also you need to receive it. You need to be on the receiving end of honor which is sort of weird to say. You need to be on the receiving end of blessing. You need to be receiving end of comfort. You need to be on the receiving end of hospitality. There's, it goes both ways. One, you need to do it. It's like, yeah, be a better Christian, do those things. But on the, other, on the flip side, you need to receive it. I think as a culture, we're sort of terrible at receiving it. Now, if you have any questions, like kind of the, the whole reality here, I wanna talk about the questions. We love questions. If you're like, dating, marriage questions. This is the place to ask. I will answer all those at Pastor Flex Podcast. We drop a new podcast every week. But this morning specifically, we're gonna be talking about honor. Now, I'm gonna define honor as respecting the image of God in another person. All right, honor is respecting the image of God in another person. So if you were to treat someone as if they were an imager of God, how would that change the way you treat them? And of course, you're like, well, when you bring God into it, that's not fair. You don't know who I'm married to. I get it. Listen, but here's, I think our culture, we don't do honor very well. So when I, when I lived in Japan, uh, it, it was like, it's a high honor culture. And so when you would be introduced to somebody, and I was there at like sixth and seventh grade. So it was like, I learned, I, my middle school years were high honor culture coming from America was kind of a rude awakening, all right? And so one of the things that you would do is like you would, like when you met somebody new, you would bow. Like you go, all right, so you bow. But if you were the less significant person, you had to bow longer than the other person who was more significant. So your elders would do one of these and then you would be relieved from your bowing. But if you didn't really know where you stood, you did a lot of this. <laughs> and so kind of what you sort of learn is that like you just, Look at your toes, look at your toes, and then when their shadow moves, you're up. Okay, and it was just sort of a weird thing. Now, the other thing that was sort of odd, like if you ever exchange business cards, and you know, the tendency, if someone gives me their business card, I go and I put it in my back pocket. That's the greatest offense of all time. You just sat on their face, right? Like that's kind of what that meant. So you always took a business card, you put it in your breast pocket, close to your heart. That's, you know, just in case you ever find yourself in Japan. And so there was a lot of things that were really awesome about that culture, and a lot of things, like especially when I came back to the U.S., culture shock because um, the way that we relate to each other here is like satire, right? Like everybody, like if you like somebody, you're making fun of them, right? So it's like, that's sort of how it was. And so I was very confused uh, as a freshman in high school, like, why is everybody so mean? You know, like I didn't, I didn't sort of wrap my head around that, that that's just sort of how it is. Now, the beauty of American cultures, we're authentic. We just tell like it is. And the odd thing is we love to dish it, but aren't we terrible at taking it? We are so good at like snappy comebacks and really quick put downs. We're great at that. And we can make ourselves laugh at our own jokes and we feel really good about that. And like that goes over like a lead balloon in marriage, doesn't it? You're like, oh, I thought you knew I was kidding. <laughs> and so um, there, I'm not, I don't want to like say like, we all need to be Japanese because Japanese culture has its own issues, right? It's like, you can almost say yes to anything, like just so there is no shame brought upon anyone. So can I have a million dollars? Yes, you can. And like, they will literally tell you yes to your face and have zero intention of doing it. And everybody's okay with that. It's just like we, and so you know that you don't get the million when it doesn't show up because 
that was just saving face. That's just the reality. So there's, there's every culture is, the gospel offends every culture in some way. So there's good news for that. In our case, we could do a little bit better in the honor part. All right, so that's what we're gonna really talk about of how to honor one another. And so kind of like I was saying is we don't honor one another because we don't live in a community that grafts honor. And then, like I said, we don't personally honor one another because we are a culture of satire. And so the person that you, in general, here in America, the ones that you're supposed to love the most, you end up treating the worst. Like the one that you're supposed to give the most honor to ends up getting the least. Okay, and then, and that's probably because we only honor people or honor those whom we feel deserve it. So the people we feel deserve it are the really successful people. When Patrick Mahomes scores the winning touchdown next Sunday, we will think he deserves MVP honors. Like that's kind of how we go with that. We're like, that was amazing. You are such a gift. We are all gonna be seeing it. We'll put it on all social media. Yay, Patrick Mahomes. But the reality is like, that's just because he won. He was an exceptional athlete. And I think, or if you're exceptionally smart or you get accolades for salesmen or accolades for your engineering or accolades for whatever it is that you do, we're like, they deserve it. They earned it. And so to honor somebody just because they're an imager of God just seems sort of like cheap. And like, like we've been talking about, it's hard for us to receive it. And I think that's probably the bigger place where, I, where we're gonna probably land a lot here. Now, uh, there's several different relationship dynamics when we look at the book of Philemon. So in fact, there's like six. Uh, there's Paul versus Philemon, which is a peer-to-peer relationship. Paul, who's a pastor hanging out in a prison. Oh, that's kind of a fun alliterate. Paul, pastor in prison, uh, is gonna be talking to well, you can't really do Philemon, Philemon, who is uh, a business owner in Colossae, 1,300 miles away, and all they're gonna do is engage each other via text, which is sort of fun. And they are gonna have like an issue with, like a, a confrontation is gonna happen over text, and it's gonna go well, which is sort of wild to think about. Think about, I mean, when's the last time you had a text confrontation go well? Anyway, all right, so then you've got uh, Philemon versus Onanissimus, and you've got the master-slave dynamic, and this isn't the sermon where we talk about how slavery is evil and dark, although it is true. Uh, we are not for slavery, but you, we're gonna have to deal with the cultural dynamic of master-slave relationship, and although it wasn't race-based slavery, it still was slavery, and it was a horrid thing, and so we're gonna watch how uh, Philemon, who is a slave owner, engaged Onanismus, and how, and how Onanismus, a slave, engages his master. And then finally, probably the way that we're gonna apply that is the employer to employee. That's about as close as we can possibly get to, because you've said, I've been working like a slave here, and all I get is, and you fill in the blank. And then finally, uh, we've got Onesimus versus Paul, a disciple versus his pastor, and going like, how far are we to really submit to one another? Because Paul is gonna ask Phile- or Onesimus to go back to Philemon and be like, hey, go be a slave again. That's an awkward request. All right, so that's what we're gonna get into, and we're gonna talk about all of that here. So would you guys mind praying with me as we, as we get into in depth the book of Philemon and just ask God to, to bless the reading and proclamation of his word. God, thank you for your word. I'm so excited we get to express it. I'm so excited that there are people here that are just kicking the tires on church. And I know there are people here that are just sort of trying to figure out what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So Lord, would you work in and through my voice, my words, hide me behind the cross and allow you to be very big and help us to figure out what it means to honor one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right, here we are. So we're gonna start off like kind of look at, we're, I'm looking to take a look at the greetings, you know, the, like the intro greeting and the ending greeting, which is sort of weird to even read, but it, it is, it's part of it. It's like this all God's word. So Paul, that's the writer, a prisoner for Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother. So he's writing, Paul and Timothy have gotten together and they're writing uh, this scripture, they don't know it's scripture at the time, they just know it's a letter they're writing, and they're writing to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and then Aphia, our sister. Some people say that, or scholars say that they were married, uh, or it could be that it's Philemon, and then Aphia, who's like the primary deacon of that church, gets a special acknowledgement, and then there's Archippus, who's been doing work with uh, Paul and Timothy. Or some people view it that Philemon's married to Aphia and Archippus is their son and the church that meets in their house. I kind of take it as you've got Philemon, Aphia, Archippus, and they forgot everybody else, so they just said the church, all right? That's kind of where I go with that. You guys ever do that where you're like, you're trying to thank everybody and you're like, 
and everybody. You know, you just give them a general, that's one of those. All right, so grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So you kind of see like, here's who's writing, here's who's receiving. This is a community in Jesus. And then he's gonna close the letter this way. This is the very end of it. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, Jesus sends greetings, okay? And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, or be with your spirit. So what he's saying here is like, we've got the whole church involved in this letter. And I, and I love that. And I think this is where, remember, Philemon is a business guy. He doesn't, I mean, he, it's not that he doesn't care what happens in Rome. He definitely doesn't care what happens in some Roman prison will have zero effect on his business life in Colossae, where he is. Like, and, and granted, like Epaphras knows Paul personally. He's the one that planted the Colossian church. But what does he know about Paul? But the, the appeal here is that they're all a part of the same community. There is no business venture. There is no f- blood family issues here. This is all people voluntarily coming together under the headship of Jesus to figure out an issue. It's wild to think about that sort of community. Now, which this is important because here it is. It's the, hey, Saul, can you help me? There we go. Paul honored his community. Okay, now when, I, when you think about that, it's the community of, of Jesus is this. It's, it's the community of Christ, this collection of people that love Jesus. And that's one of the things that I think for us as a church, we've, we haven't done this super great. And that's probably because as a culture, we don't do this super well. It, it, we, I sometimes have a Bill Belichick mindset. Do your job. You know, like, does anybody else have that sort of like, you know, we'll celebrate that at some other time. And I think that's how like the, me personally with that sort of cultural mindset can forget about honoring others. Uh, Grayson and I were at um, a mega church uh, several years ago. We visited their, this mega church, went to one of their staff meetings. And it was the, the, the staff meeting right after Easter. And the church had like done like seven services and thousands of people. And they had 200 staff about kill themselves that weekend. And uh, I'll never forget, the, the executive pastor stands up. And he's just like, I just want to thank, you know, list of people kind of like this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I know I'm going to forget some people, but thank you and thank you. And then he goes to the lead pastor. He's like, lead pastor, do you want to, boss, do you want to give these guys a little word of encouragement for all the hard work they did uh, this weekend? <laughs> I don't know if he, he stands up, looks at everybody. You did your job. And then he went and sat down, and I'm sitting there going. <laughs> and like, and the, okay, if you're not familiar with scripture, like if you're a Bible nerd, what, there's a reference there that's kind of cool. It's like uh, there's this Jesus, and, and he tells a story about a servant who, you know, does the servant go and feed himself, or does he feed the master for, first? You no, know, he feeds the master. And then, then after that, does, does the master commend him? No, he goes, he just did your job. And so that's like this funny thing. Like he's probably thinking in his head. He's like giving some satire, but nobody knew that story. And everyone's just like, you know, like they're like, you can see the anger on their faces. And I was like, okay, this is an awkward moment. This is what you don't do in a staff meeting. That's what I learned uh, from that moment. And, and I think there's just this part of it where you, like it probably was funny in his head and then it comes out as dishonoring. And then what happens, it creates a culture around that where it's like, uh, he really just doesn't care. Because, and here's, again, this is the part that I struggle with. I need honor. It's weird to say that. Do I have any self-deflectors out here? Here's what I mean by this. Like someone gives you a compliment and you like twist it back to them. It's like, you did a great job. No, you did a great job. Do you guys know those people? And you can't like compliment them. It's so irritating because like they're overly spiritual. It's like, they're like, hey, Chris, that was an amazing message. Well, you know, it's all the Lord. You know, and it's like, no, it wasn't that good, all right? Uh, like, we're not talking here on Jesus caliber, but no, what happens is I think there's this part of us that we don't know how to handle being honored. And maybe it's because we don't do it very well. And so I think what happens, instead of honoring people, we dish out like satire and in a locker room that really works. That means you love each other. Or in a, a battlefield, when you, you blood, sweat, and tears with people, that makes sense. But when you're, trying to love people that are different culture, different mindset, different lifestyle, different socioeconomic status, and you kind of throw a zinger in there because it's funny, it loses something. And the church as a whole loses something. Okay, watch, verse four. I thank my God 
always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord, Jesus, which that makes sense. You're gonna have faith and love towards Jesus. But then he says, and for all the saints, which is sort of a wild thing to think about. Like he has it not only just for the Lord, but for the saints as well. And so when I, I love that sort of thought, so watch this. So he's talking about the love and faith toward the Lord and for the saints. Well, how is that exercise? Love for the Lord and faith is, is seen in the way he treats the saints or treats people. Watch this. And I pray that the sharing of your faith, here's the faith toward people, may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Here, just, just for free, this is an aside. Did you know that sharing your faith is effective for the full knowledge of every good thing? I'm just, just reading what it says. I think sometimes we read that, I'm like, okay, what else you got? No, no, no. The sharing of your faith is effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. And I think that we miss out on the fullness of every good thing because we don't share our faith. I'm not an evangelist. That's fine. You're just gonna miss out on the knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Okay, keep moving. So verse seven, I have derived much joy and comfort from your love. I love this. So he's gonna go back to remember the, the love and faith toward the saints. I have derived much joy and comfort from your love. And here it comes. And my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. So the way you've treated other people has brought me joy and comfort while I'm in prison. Like the way you treat them affects me because I led Epaphras to Christ. Epaphras planted the church in Colossae and I'm like a big fan of this church. And whenever I hear of what you're doing on behalf of this church, it motivates me to no end. So then he's gonna say, because you've refreshed me, I'm gonna ask you something really cool. Accordingly though, I am bold enough in Christ, th accordingly, though I'm bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required. Where's my, where are my, uh, do I have any alpha males here? Like, like, yeah, they're just like, I'll just tell you what, how it is. Let's go. Like, he is this kind of guy. Like, Paul it does not pull punches. Paul is not afraid of the truth. Paul is like, hey, you just need to start doing this. Do it. And he's a leader. He's a church planner. He's an entrepreneur. He has, he has led stuff, started stuff. There is no fear, like he doesn't fear man. He's an apostle, done miracles. You know, he's been stoned to death. He's kind of been through it. And he's also an old man. <laughs> you ever heard an old man talk? <laughs> when does an old man ask nicely for much of anything? Ugh. You know, that's kind of it, right? I, I think they're, you know, I love this, I love this. I'm bold enough in Christ's command. So here's an old man in prison suffering for Jesus. And then he's gonna say, I'm bold enough to, enough to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, and I love this, for love's sake, uh, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. So I can command you, but I'm not. Because I want to appeal to you for love's sake. Now, this is, this is wild. Again, these guys don't hang out. Paul is in a prison. Philemon is running a business in Colossae. He's gonna continue, though. I appeal to you for my child, Onanismus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. In other words, he came here as a runaway slave. Now, I don't know how they ran into each other in Rome. I think the last thing that Onesimus was looking for was Jesus. He's just like, get me out of slavery. I don't know if, you know, this, the, we don't know if he got in slavery because he was conquered by some, you know, proxy war and then he was brought into slavery, we sold, bought and sold. We don't know if uh, he was in debt and sold himself into slavery or, and we don't know if like Philemon was the best master ever or the worst master. All we know is that he ran away. He comes to Rome to probably find a job, do something. And then all of a sudden he run, runs into Paul and he is transformed. And that's where he's gonna say, Paul, Formerly, he was useless to you, meaning he was a runaway slave who was a long way away from home. But now, he's indeed useful to you and to me, and I'm sending him back to you, which is sort of wild. 
Again, how far away is Rome from Colossae? Everybody Google it, 1,300 miles. All right, this would be like a 30-hour round trip drive or 30-hour one-way drive if you're just going straight and like, all right, I'll sleep. You know, we only were going to stop for gas. Like that's kind of, but here it is, 1,300 miles. This would be planes, trains, and automobiles. This would be ships and ferries and all sorts of stuff to get from Rome to Colossae. Is there really a need for Paul to send him back? Do we really need to advertise that we have Onesimus here? No. But I love the amount of like trust that is coming through in this. He's sending him back. And, it's, and this is where if you're, uh, if you're Onesimus, you're like, hey, Paul, remember in the letter? Because the letters he's carrying say, here there, in the, the one to the, the church in Colossian, here there's no uh, Jew or Greek, slave or free, barbarian, Scythian, barbarian or Scythian. In other words, everyone is equal under the eyes of Christ. Everyone has equal value. So this would be a great opportunity to, for uh, young Onesimus to be like, hey, the letter you're sending says I'm already equal, so why do we need to go about doing this? This is a 1,300 miles, because what we're gonna find is that he's gonna ask him, he's gonna go 1,300 miles to send him 1,300 miles back. That is an expensive, long trip. In fact, Paul, we find out, needs this guy. I'm sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this is perhaps why he was parted from you for a while. Why was he parted from you? To get saved. And then you could have this experience. And I love this. He's like, I prefer to do nothing without your consent. I don't want this to be like a secret deal and someone finds out like, hey, wasn't Onismus, didn't he, wasn't he owned by Philemon? Did you ever work that out? Well, we just, you know, it was 1,300 miles. That you might have him back forever. No longer as a bond servant, but more than a bond servant, as a beloved brother, which I love this. Here it is. I don't want you to think of him as a slave any longer. I want you to think of him as a, a brother, especially to me but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner and equal to you, a brother of yours, receive him as you would receive me. So watch this. Paul honored Philemon with a specific ask, not a command. Now, in our passive aggressive culture, we don't do this. In fact, uh, Single people, this is how married people talk to each other. Sure, it'd be nice if someone took the trash out around here. <laughs> you think this uh, kitchen's gonna clean itself? Man, I wonder who's gonna pick up these clothes. That's just how we talk, right? Because nobody likes direct confrontation. Because that's, is it, it's not that it's rude, it's just, uncomfortable to be direct because there's a specific need that you're presenting and that somebody else could fix. And, and again, if I'm honest with you, this is where Adrian and I in our first several years of marriage sort of struggled here. This is where we struggle. Because in, when we got married, I said, I, Adrian, I'm gonna make, this is our vow, like the wedding vows. I'm gonna make you my first ministry. And before I do any ministry for the church, I'm gonna do ministry for you. And like, I'm gonna love you because you're my love and I love, 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 love you. All right, because I was very, very excited about getting married to Adrian. She's amazing. And so uh, there came a couple years like in, it's like she would get frustrated about stuff and I'd be like, I wonder what's wrong, right? You know, you're like, and, and, and I was like, I'd ask her, so is anything wrong? She's like, no. And I'd be like, oh, I guess nothing's wrong. Has anybody ever done that? <laughs> <laughs> you ask if something's wrong and then they say no and you're like, huh, all right. I guess I just misread that one. No, but what had happened is I started to drift and I started to gotten really excited about ministering to people and getting excited about people because people are really fun and they are always going clapping for all the good things you do. And sometimes Adrian would be clapping quite as much because I thought I was doing things really great. Like she should be clapping when I like make breakfast once a month. Like, so like that, that, like there should be some real accolades for that. And I think what happened for me is I sort of missed that. And so it wasn't until we went to a counselor that we sort of discovered that Adrian would start telling me what to do and who I should meet with and who wasn't worth my time. Cause that would happen a lot. And instead of me going, Oh, thank you for that great insight. That's really wonderful. I would get sort of defensive. Can you imagine that defensive? 
Uh, and I'd be like, what do you know? I'm like, I'm a pastor. I know, I'm, I know I should spend my time. And the, act, the problem wasn't actually how I was spending my time. It's she was lonely. And she was enduring, screaming through the night, sleepless nights, and then enduring, screaming through the day as Austin and Jet were not fun of sleeping. They like to not sleep. And so there was moments where she wasn't working out, and there was moments where she wasn't sleeping, and that she wasn't like taking care of herself. And I, and so she wouldn't share that she had a need because she, like her, sort of like uh, spiritual uh, mentors that said, like you've got to, you're a pastor's wife, you got to do whatever you could do to make sure that Chris could do the ministry. And so that became like this fear that if she told me that she needed something, then I would not do my job well. But you know, I didn't sign up to marry her so that. I would neglect her. And so this, this became, like, this was revolutionary for us, right? I know this is probably gonna be simple. So like, Adrian, if you feel sad, Adrian, if, if you feel lonely, you need to tell Chris that. And she was afraid that if she told me how she really felt, that I might abandon her, that I might get mad at her. And I think there's that tendency for, I'm just gonna talk to wives for a second. There's a tendency to try to protect your husband because they can't handle you needing something. And when she started to tell me that it became a great gift, because you know what, I didn't get defensive. I got excited that I could help solve the problems. Like, oh man, you know what, I can cancel three meetings on this thing and I'll be there. It was like shocking for her that I could say no to something I really loved because I wanted to say yes to something I loved even more. Does that make sense? But it starts this, because Paul doesn't beat around the bush. It'd be really great if somebody around here gave me a slave. <laughs> no, he goes, I have a specific ask. I need help. I'm in prison. I need help. Can you send me? I'm not going to command you. I'm going to ask you, would you please send me this guy? And of course, there's uh, uh, Philemon on the other end of that going, yeah, man, I want to serve the body of Christ. I can win one for Jesus. This guy... I mean, he wasn't here for I don't know how many years. I'll definitely send him back. Do you see how that works? But I think what we're afraid of, just in general, to have a specific ask, is one, we're afraid they might say no or they're afraid they won't care. And this is where that specific ask becomes really powerful because in Christ, if we are to submit to one another, a mutual submission happens here. And this isn't just for marriage, single people. This is where you need to do this with your roommate. Because, because you haven't done this, you become passive aggressive with roommates, and so you're gonna be doubly passive aggressive with your, who you're gonna be married to. And this is because we don't know how to interact with one another. All right, now watch, watch the shift here. Watch how um, Paul then takes it from that sort of specific ask, and now he's gonna kind of, here's what he's willing to kind of pull off here. So if you consider me your partner, you're equal, like we are peers. Receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account, okay? I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. <laughs> and I love this part. Say nothing of your own, owing me your own self. Like, that church got started because I led him, uh, maybe he led personally, uh, finally him to Christ, I don't know, but he has experience with him, so he say nothing of you owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. I love that. I want some benefit from you. Refresh my heart in Christ. Then he said, I, Paul, write this with my, uh, yeah, I want some benefit from you in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say at the same time. I love this. Prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers, I'll be graciously given to you. And then, Paul honored Onanismus, he's the slave, by being willing to pay for whatever he owed. Think about that. On the socioeconomic status, here is uh, Onesimus, who's got probably nothing to his name. He's come to Rome, penniless. He can't really get it out there. Like, yeah, I'm, here's my resume. I was a former slave back in Colossae. Like, that's sort of what he's got to go on. And so he, he is sending him back, and Paul is willing to pay for whatever. So that might have been like he was in debt, and so he went to uh, Philemon that he would, be, he would serve him for seven years, and he'd get his debt paid off. That was a common thing. I don't know. But whatever it is, he's willing to pay it off. Here's Paul. Does that mean he, Paul's willing to take his place if necessary? He's, he's sort of giving him um, 
ultimate, like whatever it is, blank check, blank check authority, I will pay for whatever he has, owes you. And why does Paul do this? Because this is how Jesus treated Paul. And it goes like this, your benefit at my expense. Onanismus, I'm looking out for your benefit and I'm willing to pay for it. Why? Jesus did that for me. Your benefit at my expense. When Jesus is on the cross, he takes your sin, he takes your pain, he takes all the, the discomfort and the hurt and the wounds of the past, your benefit, my expense. That's what Jesus does. So therefore, Paul is able to say to this kid who brings nothing to the table, your benefit, my expense. No, imagine like, like if, if we, tr- like, <laughs> Think of like married couples, if you treated your benefit at my expense and like you live that way, it would be the most amazing relationship of all time. But the reason you don't is because somebody has to be the grown up. Right, this is the part where you look at it like somebody has to be the grown up, your benefit at my expense. This is where we, we struggle and we have a hard time with this because we're, we're constantly in, in battle with this, this thing of like your benefit, my expense. And I think that's where we struggle. We don't know how to do that. Now, the second part of this is Onanismus um, honored Paul by being willing to go back to Philemon. Now, you gotta think about this. You know, Paul has, is writing in those letters, there is no barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is in all, in, in all, and so therefore, why do I have to go back only to come back? It's this, again, this blank check reality of where um, I will do whatever you ask of me. You know where I see it in marriage counseling, this is what I do, I do this all the time. I, I, I have to teach couples how to apologize because uh, clearly what got learned in kindergarten does not get passed into first grade. There's no like review courses. So we'll have to sort of, you know, we'll revamp public schools to get apologies all the way through 12th grade. All right, so here's what, here's what happens, right? Is you say, I'm sorry, right? Like that's phase one, but you can't do it like this. Sorry, what? I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> And what happens, let me help us out right here. I, I, you, what I said, I'm sorry. In other words, what, what you're saying is like, I need you to say, I'm sorry, and then empathize. It must have really wounded you. It must have really hurt you. It must have been a really painful experience, whatever you went through when I did that thing. Will you forgive me? And you put the power in their hand, you zip your lip, and you go, will you forgive me? And then they would say, yes. And then that, pa- like this is where we watch it and it's amazing. Then you'd say this last part. This is what I teach couples to do all the time. I say, now I want you to ask them, what can I do to make it right? Not what can I do to make it right so you forgive me, you've already been forgiven. What can I do to make it right? And you hand that person a blank check over your life. And usually this is how this goes to marriage counseling, okay? It goes like this. Um, I don't want you ever to text that person again on social media. I don't ever want you to see that person again because it makes me feel insecure when you're around them. I, I, um, I don't want you going to that place. I don't want you doing that thing. And it's like this, this fear, but no, don't you understand? If I don't go there, I have a business obligation. I've, we, this is how my career is set up on this thing. If I don't do this thing, then I can't. And what you're saying in that moment is because of the fear. It's like, what do you want me to be a doormat? Just lay my life down? I don't, it's not that I want you to be a doormat. I just want you to trust Jesus. Trust Jesus. And the fear that you have is that you are terrified to honor someone by willing to do whatever they ask of you because you're afraid that that person might not have your best in mind. But you know who does have your best? Jesus. So when you do this, when you sort of give someone the blank check and you trust God with that, it transforms the relationship because you're not afraid anymore. Do you see how that works? So this morning, I, I want us to think like this, or this question I want us to wrestle with. Can you help me on the next slide or no? Uh, I want you to ask this question, who do you need to honor? Who is it? Who do you need to honor? Who do you need to get things right with? Who do you need to experience grace with? Who's, who do you say your benefit my expense? Now, we regularly do this where we take the Lord's Supper, and I, and I love it, because Jesus on the night was betrayed. He took bread, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body given for you. Your body is designed to ingest food and you survive off of that. Well, your soul, your spirit is designed to ingest Jesus. And so just the same way that you take on bread, I want you to take me, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
your benefit at my expense. And that same night, Jesus took the cup, wood for wine, glass for grape juice, and said, this is my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Your benefit, my expense. You get heaven and eternal life, he gets hell, his blood shed. Your benefit at his expense. And so that's, that's what I want us to think about because I feel like there might be somebody in your life you have had the opportunity to treat well, but you've treated the ones you're supposed to love the most, you've treated them the worst. And so I want us to have a moment where we just repent about that. In fact, um, before we take communion, I want us to do that. And if you're sitting next to your spouse, maybe give them a, you know, a double hand squeeze or something like, yeah, it's you, I need to honor you better. And, um, but the reality is that you can't do this without Jesus. Like you need Jesus. And um, I'm gonna throw this out here. Before you come up, before you take communion, if you're not a Christian, um, I want you to consider receiving Jesus, taking your trust from you to him and saying, I'm no longer a lord, a captain of my ship. I'm no longer in charge of anything. I'm giving it all to you, Jesus. And I'm gonna love people like you call me to love. I'm gonna honor like you called me to honor. And if that's you, if you're ready to do that, I want you to just text me. Just text Jesus to that number and we'll get it and we'll, we'll talk to you about that. And if you're willing to do that, then I want you to take communion, the Lord's Supper with us. I want you to text that, just text it. And then you're gonna come up and enjoy what it means to be a part of the family of God. And we're gonna have to help you take next steps to following him every step of the way. And if you've been a Christian, listen, you've been a Christian, and your relationships have not looked God-honoring, and you haven't honored the one you're supposed to love the most, the best. Just take a moment to repent. Say, God, would you help me to honor that person? Please, Jesus. Who is that person? I want you to think about that person, and as you take the Lord's Supper, and as you remember that Jesus your benefit at his expense, you would think, I'm gonna start living for that person's benefit at my expense. It might be your spouse, it might be a coworker. It might be somebody you know from school. It might be a complete jerk. But we're gonna respond to Jesus in the way that he loved us. So as we prepare our hearts to take the Lord's Supper, just reflect on that and let's pray. Father, thank you. I pray for your blessing to move, that your power and your grace and your mercy would fill us. And Jesus, I ask and I pray and I say, God, I know there's somebody here for the very first time who's just sort of wrestling with, do I wanna give you my life? I don't really know. I don't know how this whole thing works, Lord, but they just simply pray, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead. Holy Spirit, come into my life and make me the person you want me to be. Lord, will they start walking with you? And God, I pray for those that have been a follower of Jesus for a while, that things got hard and things got difficult. And I pray that your grace would be sufficient, that even now they could start honoring those they love. Please, God, do a great work in our lives. In our lives.